Graham was talking about changing the story and how the story um, we need to tell within agriculture hopefully is a new story. So I thought I would share my story with you today. Um, some bits when we get to the holistic plan grazing, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will know, but I'll briefly skip over them just in case someone doesn't. So my story really starts with my family. I was born, this is my own family. Um, I was born in South Devon. My family have farmed there for 400 years. These are my great, great, great grandparents in the late 1800s. And as a farmer's daughter, I was surrounded by, um, first off by obviously domestic animals, but also by wildlife. And it was the wildlife from a young age, inspired by my father, who's a keen conservationist, that really kind of got to me. And in my 20s, I decided to, uh, I started studying it as a teenager and I started taking photos of it. And uh, after university, I became a camera woman for the BBC Natural History Unit at Bristol, making wildlife films. And I worked with this guy quite a lot, who's quite a famous face. And I was very lucky to travel the world. I went to very exotic places and I did this for 12 years. And I went to real wilderness around the world. I'm very honored to have gone to these places. Yet in those 12 years, I was seeing the devastation and I was seeing this wilderness being eaten into. I was seeing more and more of this was done by agriculture and realizing that what I was born into was one of the main drivers that was devastating the world that I loved. When we were filming with Sir David, we were taking him to smaller and smaller areas of virgin rainforest because surrounding it was farmland that was ever encroaching. And then when I flew home, I realized the British countryside was no better. And it really put a complex dilemma in my head that I realized the one thing I was born into was destroying the thing I loved. And um, this is a, this graph really sort of sums it up for me because I was born in the early 70s. It's actually out of date. I was trying to find a more earlier one, but this is British wildlife. I was noticing wildlife around the world was being destroyed but at an equal rate, so was British wildlife. Um, and this has been updated this year. So when I first brought up this graph a few years ago and used to talk about it, uh, we'd lost over 50% of British wildlife in my lifetime. Now, with just five years later, we've lost over 60% of British wildlife. It's crashing, it's in a free spin, and the main driver is agriculture. So <clears throat> with my background, with this knowledge, I decided you know, there's enough pundits out there telling us we need to change farming. I decided to have skin in the game and become a farmer. And one of the things that really brought that home to me is uh, I'm going to introduce you to a line called shifting baseline syndrome. And I don't know if you know about this, but I'll briefly explain it. With it's within each of our memories of what we remember. So this was on Florida Keys, and this shows the fish catch in the Florida Keys in the 1950s. And this is what people in the 1950s would normalize as fish you would catch then. In the 1980s, this is what people normalized at that same fishing spot of this is the normal catch, and this is today's catch. So within my memory of farming, I remember these things on my family farm when I was little. They've all now gone. In my father's time, I can't believe he does remember this, but he remembers red squirrels in South Devon. He remembers marsh harriers. He remembers night jars on our farm, and he actually remembers corn crakes. Now, corn crakes now, the only place you'll find them is in, in the Outer Hebrides. Red squirrels obviously have gone up north. There's a few of them in the Isle of Wight. Marsh harriers are very rare now, and so are night jars. And then when I talked to my grandmother, she used to tell stories of my, her parents and what they remembered. And the very smiley chap in the middle, if I was there, I could point to him, but the very smiley chap in the middle with holding the horse, that's my great-grandfather. And my grandmother remembers my grandfather um, when the floods came in our meadows, 
he used to pick baby salmon up out of the, out of the meadows, put them in his cap and put them back in the stream. Today, that same stream looks like this. And probably very sadly, the only thing you're going to catch out of it is E. coli or Camptobacter because it's completely dead because of the industrial dairy farm up the road from it. But it's this generational loss that we're having within wildlife. And it's one thing I wanted to revert. And it's one thing we set out to do with farming. And we wanted to farm as part of an ecosystem. And we shorthanded that as farming with nature. So what does actually farming with nature look like in her elements? And this is what I'm going to briefly explain. And I'm going to use our farm, village farm, as an example. It means finding a parcel of land and farming it or gardening it in an pro ecologically appropriate way. It means finding species that fit that land, not pushing the land out of shape to fit the species we want to grow. And it's more in tune to looking at a piece of land like Alan Savory would as looking at it as an ecosystem. I think when we look, I mean, these are two areas, North Devon and South Devon, and these are two nature reserves. And we would never expect a nature reserve to all look the same. Yet, but when we get to farmland, it all does look the same. And it's because of the fossil fuel use and it's because of the engines we have and the tractors we have and the ability we have to change the landscape. But if you take that energy away and you take that power away, as we've done within farming, nature quickly dominates and nature sets the rules. So this is Village Farm um, and we're very much governed by the rules and it's more going back to the old way of farming. Graham mentioned 1870s. We've sort of had to go back to look a lot at what happened there to find ways of farming our land. As you can see, we're very coastal. We're right down on the tip of South Devon. We have salt water surrounding the farm. And sometimes we're a bit too close to comfort to the sea. We're absolutely blasted by Atlantic gales. And that's very much dominated how we farmed and the practices we use and the animals we use. You can also see that many of the other factors, it's not just the salt that governs our farm, it's also the bedrock, it's the soil type, it's the biology, the latitude, the sun, the wind, the rain, the topography. All of these things govern how we farm because we've taken that energy use out. And then when you look closer at each of our fields, rather than looking at them as uniform as people do so much in agriculture, we start to see them as ecosystems Every part of our farm is an ecosystem in its own right, and it's once again governed by these different elements. And so we're seeing the easiest way to see this is in by the plants that grow in each of our fields. And we've also, <clears throat> we've also planted over 90 species. Graham and others will be very pleased to hear that we have our herbal lays in there, but we've also got a lot of other wildflowers and and herbs and plants. All of them are switched to being coastal dominant, being able to survive in coastal conditions. And at Village Farm as well, we don't differentiate. There's no such thing as a weed on our farm. Every plant has an important role and they all tell us about what's going on in our soils and what's happening in our soils. And so there's no such thing as thistles, as a weed, or nettles as a weed. They are all little messengers that are telling us what's going on. Also, there's no such thing as a pest at Village Farm. This is a little bit different from most farms. But all of these are messengers too. And if we have any of them in a large amount, then they're telling us a message that we are going wrong. And I think it was Joe Salatin that said, pests and diseases are nature's way of telling you doing something wrong. And we've definitely learned that ourselves. Um, another part of it is within Village Farm is we don't differentiate between what is wild and what is domestic. We view our flock and our pigs and our goats as part of the ecosystem. We don't have wildlife on the side and then domestic. They're all one and the same. So we don't have, like most farms will have a buffer strip. This is where you have your wildlife bit and this is where you get your wildlife points with Natural England and then you grow your crop. Most of Village Farm looks like a buffer strip. 
we've amalgamated the two and we've realized that nature absolutely benefits our livestock and enables us to make an income. Another part of how we've done is we view ourselves as having a share within in Village Farm. We don't view all of the harvest that we take from the farm just for ourselves. We've, take, we've planted hundreds and hundreds of fruit trees and crop trees that we hope to undergraze when they're a little bit bigger, but we don't intend to take all of the fruit ourselves. Some of that fruit will go back to feeding the ecosystem, will go back to feeding other species, will go back to feeding some of the domestic species and us ourselves. And at this point, we're usually accused of being wasteful with the food and this is no way to feed the nation and, and what, what a way to farm. Well, there's a fact for you with the amount we throw away in fruit and veg in just one year in this, in this country. And I would say putting it into landfill is a far bigger waste of food than feeding an ecosystem. So what I would much prefer to give, see my apples being fed to a red wing or a field fair than it would to go in a bin. Another holistic approach we use, um, I think Graham was talking about having very steep, cliff, um, steep hills where he is in North Devon. We've got equally steep land in South Devon, so we can't get machinery down there, so we use animal power, the kinetic energy of animals to do the job for us. And this is our pastured pigs doing a fantastic job on bracken clearance. We also use goats on um, bramble clearance and they absolutely strip places. Um, the next bit to sort of show you, this is where we inherited. We've only been at Village Farm for three years, or well, two and a half years, coming up to three years. And this is what the pastures looked like when we first came onto the land. They've been... We'd had, um, I think it was 20 years of contractors just taking and taking and taking and not putting anything back to this land. It had been privately owned in London. The landowner wasn't a farmer. He had no care in it. It was a property investment. So the pastures looked hammered. They were completely compacted and bare patches throughout. Um, there was so much misused arable land there as well that was very good at growing moss and a few coastal species, but it had been hammered to. So the first thing after reading about Alan's, I think we came into Alan's work, as um, Simon said, in 2008. Uh, we started practicing holistic plant grazing first on my family farm and then on this farm. So by the time we got here, we were quite pro to it. And so we call these guys our biodiversity engineers. These are the sheep coming in, and their first job is really to start bringing life back to the farm. Luckily, we have quite a hardy breed because their first spring and winter was absolutely diabolical out there. They were in the worst conditions and just about pulled through. But we realized they weren't enough because our seed bank um, just wasn't there. It'd been so denuded, this farm, that we did need some mechanical intervention. So we got our neighbor, neighbor in with his CLD because we didn't want to plow. And uh, we spent a fortune on what my dad describes as weed seeds. This was wildflower seeds and herbs. And we impregnated those with mycorrhizae, which also cost a fortune. That bottle in the front... I could easily go on holiday to the Maldives for the amount that cost, but it was worth it because it was worth one hit to get those microbes and that soil fungus back into our land. Then we obviously drilled it in, let it waited for it to germinate, and this is what we have now. And this is what we are grazing. We, as Tim May was probably talking in the film, we let our pastures go incredibly high because what is above ground is also below ground. And what started as a field looked like this now looks like this. And it also we have the variety of coastal species once again coming in on our more windward side. But when that comes in, so did the life return because the insect life returned. And it wasn't just a few. Within two years, we were having over five to 600 goldfinches coming in and feeding on our crops. And this is just one of the many finch species we had coming in and grazing, oh, feeding. 
And it was so much of this recovery was to do with how we grazed. Now, I know most of you all know about holistic plan grazing, but to do a little brief interlude into it to anyone who doesn't, uh, we, have a sh we don't have a few sheep, we have a lot of sheep. Our farm is 175 acres and we have over a thousand ewes on that land. And the holistic plan grazing bit, one benefit, I guess, of having such steep land is we can easily show you what it looks like. So the spent pasture that they were just on yesterday or the day before is on the right hand side. The fresh pasture they're going into is on the left hand side and they get moved every single day. Obviously, with Alan, it all started in Africa and this to me, from my filming days, it made completely sense. When he talked about seeing these beautiful prairie lands and then looking at this dust that he saw with the domestic cattle and then coming up with the idea of where is the difference, where is it not happening, it was such a eureka moment for me reading his work and going, yes, of course, it completely makes sense. It completely makes sense that these animals are packed together because of these guys in the foreground. I've filmed it, I've seen it happen. So it was very straightforward for me to get this. And to get that movement and that running, there's the amount of years that I've spent following these animals doing that behavior, it absolutely just chimed in. But then, you know, I've um, to see that grasslands that you see in Africa and then trying to revert it into Europe and what we have in Europe, it's, you know, we, we, we don't have that dust bowl. What we have here with misgrazing is mud. And I think the other eureka moment I had was, obviously, we have such forgiving climate in the UK. I mean, this is atrocious. This is bad farming, and it's just up the road from me. But we have such a forgiving climate. You can get away with this stuff, and the grass will grow back. Obviously, we don't have lions and uh, hyenas in the UK, um, in Europe, but we did have, and in some places they still do, they have the wolves and we have the bears. So in South Devon, we don't have wolves and bears. What we have is electric fences, and that's what we use. But in a bit of an homage to what those fences do, we still call them those predators' names. So our long fences we call the bears and our short fences we call wolves. And it's nice to sort of say, rather than the fence is a bit tight, we like to say, well, my wolf's a bit tight to the flock today because it, it reminds you why we're doing this. So every day we move our flock and it's the most best way to do a health check. We've actually realized you have front runners, middle runners and back runners. Because our flock is multicolored, we can easily identify them. We have a brown girl that's always the last girl through. She's nicknamed Bungle. And if Bungle isn't the last you that day, we know anyone behind her is ill and we need to keep an eye on her or to bring her in. But it's this fantastic way of reducing our vet bills by doing this move every single day. And this for us is part of our migration around the farm. Because we're called Village Farm, it's literally, it is what it is on the tin. It's because we have a village in the middle of our farm. So we get the villagers out to help us when we do one of our long moves. And we have to traverse the farm quite a lot to get from one side to the other. Um, and this is all part of the movement and the migration, but it keeps our animals healthy. And this is our flock when they go into a high pasture in the summer. And this is fresh in the morning. And after they start, oh, sorry, after that, they start to trample, as we all know, and they're eating those top leaves with all the energy in, and they keep trampling and grazing. And as they do, this is what it looks like after eight hours of them being there. And then the next day, they go into it over their heads again, and the next day, it flattens to the ground. And then that flattening process, this is where I describe it as sheet composting, really. From a gardening world, you've got this green manure that we've grown, and then they've, they've stepped on it, they've defecated, they've urinated, and this is how to get the fertility back into your land in a really cheap, really energy-efficient way. And this 
this is my other half hope opening this out i call this the duvet effect because this sort of duvet of flattened pasture it protects the soil in the summer from drying out it protects the soil in the winter from freezing up and when you pull it apart at any time of year there's so many bugs and insects and creepy crawlies in there that it sustains such an ecosystem of life above it that all feed on it this is the regrowth after a week after the sheep have left. This is after, I think this is after three weeks and this is after a month and it's beginning to punch back and go back through. And on our rotation on our farm, we won't come back to our field for about three months. By doing this form of grazing, these are the things we don't do to our land and way we've saved money, um, which has made our energy bills really low. Uh, we do a, a diesel audit every year of red diesel that we use on the land and this year with our 175 acres we've used the grand total of £150 worth of diesel. That's it. Um, we also don't drench our animals routinely by doing this because the um, rotation is so long. It means that the pathogens have died before we root, root, um, before we get back to that area for them to graze again. It also means that we don't use any sprays on our animals as we used to once back on my father's flock. Um, this again has helped. This is basically one, one thing to do with the pasture being healthy and lack of pathogens. The other thing is to do with um, the fibre within the long stalks, making the animal's dung a lot more solid so they don't, in not much detail, but they don't get pooey bums. So we don't get the strike problems that other flocks get. Because we don't do this and because we don't use insecticides, which essentially this is on their backs, um, we have a diverse amount of insects within our, um, within our pastures that aren't killed off by anything we're putting on our flock. It also means that we can sell our wool as pure organic wool and we've got that market open to us. But because we don't drench and we don't use insecticides on our animals, we have an amazing amount of dung beetles come back to our flock and back to our farm. And we've counted six different, oh, eight different dung beetles. We've even got some of the really rare dung beetles that um, you only find in a few places now because they're the winter type. These are the native British dung beetles and some of them only come out in the winter and they're now really rare because most people barn their animals and so those dung beetles aren't there. And because of those dung beetles and because of the way we're grazing and because of the lack of chemicals, these are just some of the species that are able to survive. We've actually brought little owls back to our pastures because one of their main diet is dung beetles. The other side to talk about with the way we're grazing is soil carbon. We've got Rothamsted Institute have come in and through our, our work with the Woodland Trust, we've planted a lot of trees on our farm, which I'll get to in a mo. They've actually sponsored Rothenstead to come in and do soil carbon analysis. And they're, analyze, uh, they're, going, they're taking baseline samples here and then they're going to come back in five years' time. And the big challenge is, are we going to lock down more soil carbon in our pastures than our woodland strips? That's the question. And it'll be fascinating to see. But because of this form of grazing, then because we are trampling in so much organic matter that is then feeding the root system and is then feeding the mycorrhizae in the soil, it enables that soil to lock down carbon. And there's a the little bit more of those guys just taking the carbon there. Um, to be as natural as possible, I think. I've certainly seen it from my own farming family, is they pick a species of animal, of, of whether it's sheep or cow, and then decide to farm that, and then bend the farm out of shape to actually farm it. Say, I don't know, say like a Beltex, or say like a Holstein, and you suddenly you're having to create all these feedstocks to actually feed that animal. We've gone the other way. We've actually looked at our landscape and got animals to fit the landscape. It's an old Darwin thing, but form follows function. 
So the actual form of the animal has followed because of its function. Because we are where we are, because we are absolutely torn apart by the gales, we've had to get really hardy animals in. And they've had to be able to really be happy on eating just pasture alone and finish on pasture. They've had to be able to nurse themselves and birth themselves. I don't want to be out there um, having to deliver every single lamb that we have. I want them to be good natural mothers. And also they have had to survive the elements and not just survive them, they have to absolutely thrive in them and be as solid as possible. They've also had to protect their young because we're not going to persecute any predators on our farm. So this is um, one of our little ewes. She's an absolute demon with the ravens because we have a lot of problems with coastal ravens where we are and she actually runs around and chases them off. But we also, oh, sorry. And that's one of the other things, going back to pests and vermin and saying that we don't have any we embrace that we have predators and we have scavengers on our farm and all of them have a purpose. We're not going to persecute anything because I think that's where you get ecological gaps coming within your farm and within an ecosystem and that's where disease comes in and that's where pestilence comes in. If you get The more animals you get on your farm, the better the ecosystem is, the more it's balanced. That also means that, yes, we do have foxes taking a lamb now and then, and we do not persecute that fox. It's, there's been a real battle with me of my farmer side and foxes taking some of my lambs. And then the other side of me said, well, look at the lambs they have taken. If they do take a lamb, they take a weak lamb or they take a lamb from a really rubbish mother. And those are the most galling ones because the lambs themselves may be healthy at the time, but I now know from experience, give it three, four months, and that's a sickly lamb because they've had such a rubbish mother. So in a really harsh way, and it's actually, perhaps it's a more easy way, the fox made the decision for me that I would then make months later when I come to sell the animal or get rid of animals. But we also have Rebecca on hand, a very glamorous shepherdess who's, um, who's fantastic. Rebecca's got a background in ecology, and it's not just me out with the flock now. I now have a shepherd as well. And I think it, without her technical help this morning, I wouldn't be talking this morning. But she's been a great help. We don't, because they are domestic animals, we're not leaving them completely to the elements and to the wild. We do have a bit of human intervention too. And that brings us to what is our human intervention within the field system and within our farm system. And it's questioning the right to give back. It isn't all about humans just taking all the time. We are part of this ecosystem. We need to rebalance where we are in this ecosystem and not just see an ecosystem as just taking for um, basically for us to take all the time. We need to give back. So one of the ways we've been giving back is by planting trees. And haven't we planted trees? We've been here for two winters and we've planted 15,000 trees in those two winters. Um, here they are growing up. And this year, just for madness and just for giggles, we've decided to plant 10,000 trees. And we're working with the Forestry Commission to get those in. These trees work as, in the long term, will work as fodder. They will work as shelter belts from the heat and also from the storms. And they will also work to increase the biodiversity on this farm. We've also dug ponds, many ponds across the farm, and they work for the domestic sports stock as well as um, other wild species. And we're, we're using them as watering ponds and watering holes, but when they're not in use for that day paddock, they then revert just to being wild ponds for the wildlife. And then we've also made a huge amount of bird boxes and nesting boxes, because once again, we understand the more ecology we get on our farm, the more healthy our farm becomes. Uh, we work very much within the holistic side of thing of planning where we're going to graze, at what time we're going to graze and why we're going to graze. And one of those factors is protecting the wildlife on the farm as well as giving the animals the best possible food. So at certain times of year we won't graze because we have orchids in certain places and we will fence off those orchid areas. We will also bypass certain parts of our farm at certain times of year because we're letting the wild animals have the right first. 
So we have areas where we have the deer um, putting down their fawns while they go off to graze. There's other areas where we have a huge amount of skylarks nesting. So we allow the skylarks to raise their young before we go in and graze those fields. And this is where people go, well, that's all very well, Rebecca, and talking about nature first, but where's the money in all of this? You know, it's all very well to have these high fluting ideas, but how are you paying for all of this? Well, if we go back, and I do remind you that I have a thousand animals here um, on 170 acres. I think that's not too bad. I will give you that the sheep aren't the biggest sheep in the world, but they're also not the smallest sheep in the world. And as my dad would say, um, they, don't make, uh, they don't make diamonds the size of bricks. Um, meaning that our animals may not be growing that huge, but they taste really good. And we've really worked hard on this. Because I know Caroline, and I'm really sorry to miss Caroline, but I know Caroline will be talking about eating ourselves healthy and the land healthy earlier, um, later on. But I just wanted to touch on this because... That's how we are funding all of this and our business is it is a business. It isn't a charity. We're not a nature reserve. We are actually a farm. And it is about eating the land healthy. And our flock is the way forward. So one of our main sales is our home sales of lamb boxes. But we also get a lot of chefs. If we can, we'll get the chefs to the farm and share the story of our farm to those chefs that will then go to the restaurants. They'll promote our meat in the restaurants. And we also, if we can't get the chefs to the restaurant, uh, we can't get the chefs, we will go to the chefs. We will give them trials. And it's definitely been more the Michelin star chefs and the real connoisseurs of good tasting meat that have gone for our wares. But what we found is by promoting it, then they promote us. By befriending these chefs, they then become, it's an awful corporate word, but brand ambassadors for us. So when they do the food festivals, we supply them with meat, we supply them with leaflets, they then go out and sell those to the audience, and then that returns in sales to us. We also court the food writers for exactly the same thing, invite them to the farm. We understand the importance of getting articles and the importance of the media. The more we can get publicity to what we're doing, the more the meat boxes sell, the more we're able to fund what we're doing on the farm. And so that all returns back in meat box sales. But obviously, because we're sheep, we've also got the wool side of things. Um, because we're using rare breed and because they've got particularly fine fleeces on them, we have diverse colours that come in. One of the biggest or oh, very lucrative market for us is the hand spinner market. And where my dad is selling fleeces for a couple of quid, I can sell for a very high £30-40 pounds of fleece to a hand spinner. And you can sell just a few fleeces, you know, 20-30 fleeces and you've easily God, you've, well, not even 10 would cover the shearing bill, but you've easily covered your shearing bill and up. The other market is because it's 100% organic. A lot of baby um, places have been quite interested in our wool because um, there's that need now of people wanting to, obviously wanting to be precious with their youngsters and having the most purest elements around them. But from one end of the life to the other end of life, the, one of the biggest markets we've had is this last few years, and it has bought up most of our fleece, is a lady on Dartmoor that makes eco-shroud felted coffins. And uh, she loves our story because it ties in with her story. And so she has been able to sell us and sell on to her customers. But the way we judge how we farm and how successful we are, if you remember about the shifting baseline, is who we've got back. And with just the three years that we've been here, these are some of the guys. So we got, we've got hedgehogs back, which we're thrilled about. Uh, we've got little owls back. We've got barn owls back. We've got curlew now coming into our fields. We've got lapwing, which are so are maybe very common up north, but are very rare in Devon and Cornwall. They're now coming in. Clouded yellows are now coming in. Snipe, which have dropped hugely, crashed in number, are now wintering in our fields. And hares are now coming in and boxing in March and April. 
And these are just some of the birds with the rest we've done on our hedgerows that are now coming and making our hedgerows then um, uh, their nests and where they're producing their young. But this is always at the back of my mind, and this is, this is always why we're doing what we're doing, and it's this crash in wildlife in the UK. And we're only a small little island. We're a tiny, we've got a tiny, and us as a farm, we're a tiny little farm, but we're doing all we can to fight this against what this crashing line, because I really think it's important we do. And that's why we farm with nature. And... Um, and that's my end of my talk. I did have some lovely business cards today to chat to you all, but unfortunately, because I'm not there, please just do take the top here in my website. And if you want to get in contact, please do.